my uh, childhood home in the middle of nowhere, Leonard, Michigan. And uh, I'm supposed to go live here on Mondays, Monday evenings, and uh, I got caught up with a little, uh, little family activity. And so I thought I would show up and say hello and give you a brief tour of the, uh, of the place that I grew up. I've carved in this space, in this, on this property for like 16, what, 15 years or something? Is that right? No. Here, let me see if I can reconnect this. There we go. Hopefully it's stabilized now. Can you guys hear me okay? Is the Wi-Fi in here Verizon, Dad? Hey, what? Is it Verizon? The Wi-Fi? The router? Is it Verizon or Netgear? It's not. <laughs> Can you guys hear? I'm getting two different. It's Netgear. I'm. G <laughs> They're telling me two different things at once. Mom's yelling it's Verizon. You're saying it's Netgear. <laughs> I'm saying the router in the pole barn is Netgear. Do I want to be connected to the router in the pole barn? This is my dad, everyone. Hi. Do I want to be connected to the router in the pole barn? You got bars? Not too many, but. Anyway, so I grew up out here. This is uh, five acres next door my grandparents used to own. And it, there were, let's see, three, four gardens out here. And you can still see where the ground is bare. Um, I love to garden out here. I spent almost every day in the summer when I was, especially from ages, say, say nine to... 15 or 16 I would go out there and I would garden and I absolutely loved it and uh, And I think that slower pace, you know, my grandparents were Greek I'm Greek immigrants immigrants. Wow, that's a, that's a good one and They had the same sort of old-world methodology or thought process or way of going about life and they they love to, to to grow things they like to see the yield of their hands the the uh, they just did things a little differently than we do. And I loved that. And I think that's what drew me to carving in a way that kind of primed me psychologically for the slower things, right? Carving is a slower thing. It's not a fast paced thing, unless you're a speed carver or a chainsaw speed carver or something like that. But so anyway, so I, and it's lots of wood. So I'd bring the, I'd bring the bark that I found out in Lakeville, which is a town about 10 minutes from here. And I'd bring that bark over here and I'd watch my Ron Adamson videos. And I would and I would absolutely just demolish those videos. I'd watch them over and over again and I'd wait and I'd check every morning for Ron Adamson videos to see about how he did his amazing bark carvings and I would try to emulate them. And I made my own carving station here that's now gone because my dad has repurposed the space. but. This is where I used to carve growing up. I had a fixture board attached to these two by fours right across here. Those are some old awards that I left behind. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I left that one behind, you can tell why. But that was a nice one. Some of these are older. And uh, what does that one say? That's a uh, 20, like 15 maybe. That's a cool one. And, um, that was my wall of great wall of arrogance, great wall of cockiness right there. And so, uh, so guys, really, I have a, I have a couple of people to thank for this. Uh, of course my parents, so maybe make it more than a couple, but they encouraged me to carve. They were very supportive. They were always so, so encouraging when I made a carving, it made me feel good. But then this guy, Ed Denewith, I met him shortly the day that after I started, you know, a few days after I started carving, uh, very serendipitously, my mom was friends with this lady 
And this gentleman was a carousel horse carver, and he gifted me this carving and a bunch of wood. I never did anything to it. He wanted me to finish it, but I just thought it was so neat. I could never do, could never bear to finish it, but so it still lives up there. So Ed Denewith was the guy gave me my, gave me my first basswood um, and, and a bunch of books from Ian Norbury, and he infected me with uh, this desire to, to learn to carve portraiture in wood. And so, of course, I just, you know, I loved Norbury, but I, my favorite was Adamson because I loved the way that Adamson would incorporate the natural wood, and he was just a cool dude, wasn't he? Remember his YouTube videos? He was such a, remember me watching those when I was oh, a kid? Yeah, Adamson? He was a cool guy. Yeah, he still yeah. is. Yeah, you were, you, that goes back to when you were a little tyke. Right. So, Ed Denewith. Obviously, my parents, mom, mom and dad, uh, Ron Adamson, and then, of course, Don Gunther was the lady to first introduce me to carving. That, that, the first carving I ever did was a soap carving at a, a wood carving. The first carving I ever did was a soap carving. And then she, uh, she that, that history teacher quickly transitioned, uh, tr transitioned me by virtue of letting my mom in on this little secret of a wood carving kit that uh, I picked up and carved a boot from and uh, absolutely like fell in love, you know? Totally entranced, totally entranced. Like I could not get away from it. I was totally obsessed. You know, like three hours, you know, four, three and a half hours of just sitting in one spot for me was a huge deal because I couldn't sit in one spot as a little kid. I've said that very many times, but it's true. Uh, right, because I was a pretty wild kid, Dad. I mean, I was hard to tame, wasn't I, as a little kid? High energy? Yeah, I would say that might be an understatement even. That might be an understatement. <laughs> so... Definitely, uh, we had people to see and places to go. But, people you know. to see and places to go. <laughs> anyway, but carving was definitely slower, you know, Slow, slows you down. So that was a good thing for my brain, and I'm, I'm still very grateful that I had you guys and... Don, or, uh, uh, Don, Ed Denewith, Ron Anderson, all those guys who made those great videos, Ian Norbury for the books and all that. Anyway, enough of that, but the, I'm here with my old, uh, bark pile, see? <laughs> you thought I was going to say my old pop? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I qualify. No, no. <clears throat> that, this is, uh, this is, these are my old stomping grounds when I was a kid. So, I mean, I was spoiled to have all this space in here. My dad let me uh, terrorize his wood shop as an old carving. You're still terrorizing it. I still am. Look at, you're right. Look at it. Look at all that wood that I have here. <laughs> and look at all these carvings I've left behind. It's all good. Look. I love it. Yeah. Hopefully one day you can terrorize my barn, dad, when I have a barn big enough to... To tear, to, for you to terrorize it. <laughs> it's an old, these are some old carvings I left behind and didn't sell or maybe never finished. So they just haunt me. You need a hand? You need a hand? Maybe not. Let's see. Let me go. Okay, there's comments. I should read these. Hey, John, Belmonte Steak. Okay, good. You can hear me. Dale. <laughs> uh, John, you have my grandfather was fourth generation in the hills of Kentucky and knew everyone within miles. How cool is that, John? Yeah, Clips Day. Did you guys get to watch it? I did. My dad and I watched it. He brought his welding mask over my house. Where is he? He brought his welding mask over to the house and we, we sat there and looked up at the sun and that was honestly, it was so cool. I was geeking out, so I, I loved that. All right, ordered your sponsor magazine. All right, John. Yeah, you should receive it physically, and it comes quarterly in the mail. That's an awesome shop. Race the Reaper says, yeah, it is, isn't it? I tried carving Mrs. Claus the other day and did not go well. Yeah, that one's tough, man. I don't think mine went very well either. Where do you get your cottonwood bark? I used to find it. So the cottonwood bark, um, wow, look at all that. Uh, insulation I mangled from jamming that bark into the insulation. 
this is uh, my, all that's left of my bark pile. But I go out west every year to Montana. Well, I used to. I haven't gone in a couple of years. But um, friends would come with me on camping trips, and we'd collect the bark along the Yellowstone River and the I think it's called the Two Forks River or the Tongue River. Um, all these places around Mount Wyoming, Montana, the uh, you know the western or sorry the 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 northeastern corner of Montana. These are the areas that we would uh, collect the bark from, and I have yet to go out. We're, my wife and I uh, we're, we're talking about going out this year. We, I guess I, I'm not sure if we're doing it, but I'd like to. So isn't this beautiful? This is old blue. This is the truck that my dad drove me to art shows with growing up, and my mom and dad would help me load up my stuff and take me to art shows. And this is the uh, the pond that I grew up fishing on and swimming in with my neighbor, Anthony, who is out here. You know, your neighbor might be a mile away, and that's that's your neighbor. So my closest buddy was probably somewhere near a mile or, or more away from me. And we would, we'd swim in our pond. He had a pond too. Probably half the summer we were in that pond. He taught me to swim out there. And uh, this is all butternut, these, these, this firewood. And uh, funny story about that. This year I had this big deer project I was carving and uh, ran out of firewood. And I saw this stuff and I had a lapse of memory that this was carving wood and I started feeding it into the fire. And I'm thinking, man, this stuff is so light. I wonder why dad kept his firewood up here and why this all looks so different from the normal firewood. And sure enough, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Race the Reaper saying he's going to have to find some bark elsewhere because there's none in Southern California. Yeah, not that I know of. The, the, the bark that I collect really likes the northern, or sorry, the, the plains, you know, the P-L-A-I-N-S. Plains of the United States, and you can find bark north of the plains too. Black cottonwood up in Canada, and, you know Idaho, and you know all, all above the plains. I guess that would that be up in Saskatchewan. I don't know, but the plains out there, there's a lot of bark in those regions too. But it's a darker bark. The black cottonwood is darker, and it's a little bit more fibrous, and it's it's not quite as beautiful as the the Montana Gold, which is considered plains cottonwood bark. And that is the that is the bark that I'm getting mostly. And I have a friend who's out there, who I visit every every once in a while. And he he continues to send me a box of bark every once in a while, and uh, I pay him for it. Because again, I haven't made it out there in a while. So chipping away, there you go. Chipping away is a good online source. So those of you asking, there you go. Yeah. I had a three-wheeler when I was, uh, I don't know, 16 or 17, and I left it out by the end of the driveway and uh, couldn't get it started. That's why it landed up out there. Came the next morning to grab it, get it started, and it was gone. So someone stole it. That was the end of that. I was, uh, I was on bike for the rest of that summer. Anyway, this the... <coughs> The beauty of this space was that, um, you know, you could do massive projects. And I didn't realize it growing up, but I had all this space and all this uh, opportunity to make carvings. And, you know, you could make a mess in one area and not even notice it if you moved a few feet over. <laughs> Whereas now in the shop that I had, it's different. But the downside to it was that it was difficult to heat. And so my dad and I built this this queen shop, little mini space, maybe 16 feet by 12 feet over just encasing this area. And it was plastic covered. And I just had just enough space for this furnace to, you know, pipe to travel through in that visqueen. And that would, that would heat, that would create a vapor barrier and it got pretty warm. And I worked in that plastic <laughs> space. It wasn't pretty, but I worked in there for at least a couple of years until I tore it down and turned it into a workbench. So all the two-by-fours from that I put together and copied my dad's workbench design. So someone just walks onto your property and steals your three-wheeler. Can you believe that, Shuey? Shuey. Yep. 
Race the Reaper says, wanted to say thank you for your videos. They are great and inspire me to improve my skills from just whittling to carving. Ah, that's awesome. Hoping to be able to take your class not too far from now. Ah, I appreciate that very much. Yeah, so I'm going to stop holding this camera because it's, it's uh, pretty shaky. But uh, this is it, guys. This is where This is where I spent my childhood. I lived here from ages 9 to 22. 20, I had just turned 23 when I moved out about my first house. And I still worked in this space for two years after I moved out because I had yet to build my shop. So I would trip out here and work in this space. My dad was super generous with his, with his space for so many years. And he obviously he still is because look at all the wood. Look at all the wood and the carvings I have left behind. <laughs> Uh, imagine the, the storage fees that I'd be paying if it weren't for him. So, yep, they're just everywhere. This is one that Abby roughed out that uh, I've yet to finish. Peterson. So that'll be a fun one. But yeah, birch in here. I've got butternut. I've got basswood boards. That's what these are. There's butternut logs that are cut into firewood shapes. This is all basswood up here. And, uh, very generously donated by my uh oh gosh i'll put his name in the comments i can't it's escaping me because i have a bad memory but he was just a great dude give me lots of basswood this is is this ash dad that is something i got from jim jim who um, well i guess it doesn't matter to them <laughs> i come off that sawmill cool i think it's white oak. ash i think it's white oak white oak I think it's going up that sawmill. Jim, oh. <laughs> you know, Jim, uh, you know, Alex and... Uh, oh, yeah, Jim Wilkinson. Wilkinson yeah. yeah, Jim, my dad has a sawmill out here. That's pretty cool. Thanks to Jim Wilkinson from JSC. Or no. No, G, it's, what is it? J -S J C S rather. Would, would, uh people <laughs> what is our business called dad jcs wood tree removal Something like that. yeah yeah well this is a riveting live stream right we'll get back to carving next week guys so you know if that's what you're thinking about right now oh this is okay here's a fun tangent so this is alabaster i remember i was at an art show next to a guy who was JC Tree Service. There you go. Thank you. And I think it's JCS. Anyway, this is a conversation I'm having with a guy next to me at an art show. He's really beautiful tables and, and chairs, and he has a carved face set into the back of one of those chairs. And I'm looking at it, and I'm going did you carve this from stone? And he said, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I carved it from stone. I'm like, that's amazing. How on earth did you do that? And he was like, well, I just used chisels. I'm like, you're kidding me. You can carve stone with chisels? He says, absolutely you can. I'm like, where do you find this stone that you can carve with chisels? And he said, well, it's in Michigan. And I'm a Michigan local. So at this point, I'm beside myself with excitement. I'm like, where is this stuff coming from? I have to find it. So he gives me the address to this, to this place with handwritten instructions. He writes it on an old crappy piece of paper that I kept in my pocket with, with uh, you know, really rough approximations of where things are. Like, you look for an old effed up fence and a crappy mill, and then on the left-hand side, you're going to see a pile of rocks. And so my brother and I go up there on a total whim, Absolutely no expectation of finding this stuff because, you know, my instructions were handwritten. There's no, there's no real GPS coordinates here, right? So we go up there and sure enough, we, we look around by the mill and the effed up fence and we don't find anything. And so we turn around, we give up. We had fun anyway. It was a nice little trip up north, maybe four hours north of where I lived. And on our way home, turned down a side street. 
just for fun and looked off to the left into this open field and saw this very, very unusual mound. This sort of translucent white mound, almost alien. This is a dirty piece. It's not the best example, but it looked as though it was made of like a blue crystal. So we pulled over and we take a look at this stuff and we immediately start running out to this field. As we get closer, we get more and more clear on the fact that this <laughs> has to be this has to be alabaster. Out as we walk to this pile, looking looking at the ground, there's grass growing. Grant the grass growing out from the cracks of this blue translucent. Absolutely just overwhelmed with laughter. My brother and I were laughing. We, we uncontrollably laughed 15 minutes, get our, pull ourselves together and realize this is gypsum alabaster. This is uh, the exact, this is the exact stone that uh, this gentleman was talking about. And so I was uh, taking this stone, piling it up in my Honda uh, element and brought it back home with my brother. And uh, first thing I did, wash it off. And it was a fantastic, a wonderful, wonderful experience to car. And I did, I did uh, for, for a year, I did mostly stone carving. I thought, I'm gonna be a stone carver. I'm gonna be a professional stone carver and that's all I'm gonna do from now on. I'll get way more money and I'll have way more fun and it's so cool, everything's great. And I carved it for a year and I got it in my dust, in my, in my every crevice of my body and my lungs. You know, I just didn't really pay too much attention to pr use, protecting my, my orifices. <laughs> and I got pretty sick and I kind of got tired of it and I put it away. And then of course I figured out that you have to wear a mask and got back into it again. And so it's always been a part of my repertoire of materials. I've come in and out of using it. That's a really nice material to carve, alabaster. So if you haven't gotten alabaster before, you can get it, um, you know, and, and all, over, all over the United States, but, you know, north of, nor, northern Michigan, you can find alabaster, and you can also find it out west. So I'm no expert in alabaster, but it's a, fan, it's a really, really awesome material to carve. So, well, guys, I should probably go. I'm probably uh, boring you with my stories, and uh, on top of that, I've got to pick up some stuff and head back to the house. But I just thought, you know what? I didn't really plan to go live, but I'm headed to my parents. And I just thought you should get a little look at what what things are like around here. <laughs> right, Dad? Yeah. Yeah. Show them how it's done. This is the auto shop side. And this is what my dad does, which is mind-boggling the things he does in here. Restoring old cars. Look at this old Porsche. Isn't that cool? 911. And this old uh, wagon. Riveting. <laughs> I thought we were talking about wood, not metal. <laughs> I'll just see myself out. That guy's got a sense of humor like mine. And this is my truck. Okay, all right. Say bye, Dad. Bye, Dad. <laughs> Thanks for watching guys. See you in the next one. And if you haven't already, check out the online school in the link below if you want to learn to carve faces, portraits, and all that stuff. Or not, just enjoy yourself and the free stuff here on YouTube. So talk to you guys. Bye.